All right, we're live. I'm out in California. This is David Knox coming to you live for the first Monday Administrator and Manager webinar, Monday, November 2nd, 2015. I always love doing these webinars. I get to be out in the sunny weather for a while, but I'll be back in the Minnesota cold in, uh, in a few hours. So welcome to the webinar. Uh, as I, I want to begin with letting you know when the next one's going to be. I've chosen to do it Monday, December 7th because the traditional day on the 30th, I just felt it was too near Thanksgiving. Everybody's going to be off for four days and I'm pretty sure on that Monday when people get back, uh, they're going to have other things to do. So I'm just going to delay a week. I hope you all agree with that decision. And today I'll talk about the uh, November 2015 videos and then we have our guest presenter, Jack Cotton. And I'm sure anybody, any of you who've been a member for a while certainly have heard of and know about Jack Cotton, so I'm looking forward to getting to him. Uh, but let's begin with the monthly email amounts announcement. I have some new members on the webinar. So uh, for the new members, at the beginning of every month, we try to post our videos by the first Tuesday. They usually go up the Friday or Saturday, sometime the latest, the Sunday before. And we send out this email, and it goes only to administrators and managers. We don't ma email your agents. So we leave it up to you to forward this to your, if you're an administrator, forward it uh, to your agents. And, um, and then again, you can also download our user guide and send that out. And um, this is uh, a scene from, I don't know, about an hour ago. Uh, one of our members out in the Baltimore, Washington area Skype me into the meeting. And they set everything up and they get around a big table and I do a, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minute presentation. Then we do a Q&A and everybody gets a kick out of it. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm asking a lot of people, why haven't you done that? And one of the answers I hear is, well, I don't, I don't know how to use Skype. Um, well, then to all of you, I would just say go to Skype.com, download it, and, um, and make sure you have a camera. And, and if you have any questions, give me a call and, and Skype me in. Um, I'm going to be at the NAR convention for, I think, my 20, probably the 28th year in a row. And I'm going to be in booth uh, 1611. And I'd like you to stop by and say hello to me, and we'll do a couple of things. Uh, one of the things I'll do for you is I'll videotape you and me together. So you and I can stand in my booth, and I'll say, hello, I'm David Knox, and you can say your name, and we talk to your agents, and we do like a one-minute promo video about the training and logging in, we'll just have some fun. And then we edit the clip and we give you the clip and you can put it on your website or show it to your agents or whatever. So stop by the booth and I'm doing two seminars, one on uh, the sales side, I'm doing uh, values-based success planning, my goal setting seminar, and then I'm also doing uh, mastering your recruiting interview. So that's going to be uh, part of it. So now uh, the videos for the month, KFT92 Open House Follow-Up. I was actually doing a seminar for one of our members in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we decided that one, they had just done a company open house weekend of 535 open houses. And they wanted me to talk about, you know, how do you follow up after open houses? So that's what the topic is. The video is a bit longer at 14. I hope you don't mind. And then this month's quick tips, QT13, save time with buyers. Robin Allen describes how he sets expectations for how long it takes to find a home. It's, I don't know, one or two minute video, but it's just brilliant. And then QT15, Sphere of Influence calls. Ellen Hill is a, is a lady who was a new agent last year, and now she's number one in her office. And one of her comments on Quick Tip 15 was that she doesn't see Sphere of Influence calls as trying to get referrals. She sees it as, you know, there's a lot of realtors out there aren't that good. So she says, when I call them, I'm actually offering them a service on how to get the, the best you know, real estate service. Before I get to Jack, um, I, I want to do one thing here. Speaking of being in Atlanta, many of you saw Deanne Golden, and she was on our RET webinar. She talked about her smart office, and she talked about recruiting, and she talked about how she uses our training in recruiting. So we went down and did a full-day video shoot with her, and all of that video is going to be uploaded into the management section uh, soon. It's going to obviously be a lot of video. It's going to take a while. But I want to show you a clip. I've been telling you all that Dan Golden uses our training to recruit. So I had our guys do a, just a quick one minute video of Dan. And by, I'm going to play this video. And by the way, video over an, uh, a webinar doesn't play very well. The audio works, but the video is kind of weird because video is 30 frames a second and a webinar is 15. So ignore the quality, but just watch and listen to what Deanne Golden does. This is a, by the way, this is a live recruiting interview that we videotaped, uh, I think it was last, uh, I don't know, whatever, last Tuesday or something. Here it is. What's going to be most important in a brokerage firm for you? 
Well, for me, for being a new agent would be training. It's so important to have that foundation, not just as a new agent, but along your career growth. Right, 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 sure. Let me share with you a little bit about how we approach training. We have built an incredible online resources of training, and I'd actually love to show you a little bit of it. We feel our agents can have real-time training when they want it, where they want it, for what they need it for. We have access to all 300 of David's online videos, and this has been an incredible tool for our agents to access 24-7. Here, type in right here in the search field, type in open house. Perfect, then hit enter. Okay, so now you've got probably seven, eight different videos. Some are 13 minute, one seven minute. There's downloadables that you can access so you can have checklists when you go to your open house. And this is the fun part. And when you have kind of infused yourself with this thinking and these scripting and these dialogues, these words start to magically flow. And you're like, ooh, I sound good. And it's because you have been listening and perfecting not only what you say, but how you say it, and that increases your effectiveness. How does that look? I love that. I think, I think that's awesome. You think that'll meet your needs in terms of training? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Absolutely. Great. So again, that was a live clip. That's, that was Deanne Golden during a recruiting interview. And the way she set it up, uh, we didn't have that part of the clip, but she starts off and says, you know, what are your challenges in getting the real estate business? What are things you're hoping for us? And, you know, they'll come up and talk about training, and that le leads her into a discussion. So I know recruiting is a big deal to you. Use us. Use us because it's a great benefit for recruiting. So now for the fun part, if you are ready, I get to introduce my uh, guest speaker, Jack Cotton. Jack is a longtime friend of mine. I think he and I were at the National Speakers Association Convention somewhere in the mid-90s. And uh, I have done a seminar for his uh, board and association. I've done a presentation at, at his office. And, and Jack is a very, very well-respected professional, not only in real estate, but specifically as in, in the luxury market. So he's not all, all across the U.S. He's just a fun guy, a lot of class, really knows the luxury market. And I'm so happy that he has joined us. So he founded Cotton Real Estate in 74, and he's overseen thousands of purchases and sales in Cape Cod properties. In fact, he took me on a tour of Bunny Mellon's listing for $26 million. I'll probably let him tell you about that. And uh, the beauty of guys like Jack is that no matter how good and how smart they are, they just continue to grow and learn and things like that. So he created the Cotton Center for Real Estate Studies at the Cape Cod Community College in 2006. Now, he has featured very heavily in our luxury curriculum. In fact, let me, uh, before I turn Jack on, these are the, some of the videos that he's in. And if you go to presenters, featured agents, you scroll to uh, Jack Cotton. You will see all the videos in which Jack has appeared. And I think this was my most... <laughs> fun when Jack took me out on his boat and we did a tour of Oyster Bay Harbor and he just told me some great stories. In fact, here's a link. Uh, let's see if I can get this to, to load up. It's always a risk to do it. Um, I don't know if the Wall Street Journal, we'll have to scroll down here, but Jack, uh, somewhere down here there's an article on Jack selling this multi-million dollar home. I'll let you guys do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change presenter view to you, Jack. So Jack, Thanks for joining us. How are you? I think I'm here. Can you hear me, David? I can hear you just fine. I'm just sending a presenter, presenter view to you, sure and you've got to accept it. Okay. Hopefully now you can see my screen. I can see your screen. Hey, Jack, thanks really for, for joining us. Uh, like I said, you've been a great friend and a mentor and supporter over the years, so I think our members are going to get a lot out of it. So I turn it over to you on the seven steps of luxury real estate. Yeah, we're going to talk today about seven steps to breaking into luxury real estate. As you may know, I'll mention at the end of this presentation that, gosh, 2005, I think it was, I wrote a book called Selling Luxury Homes. And as part of that book, I talked to agents all across the country and, in fact, around the world. And the number one question I was asked over and over and over again was, how do I break into luxury real estate? In my market, there are so many strong competitors there now. How do I break in? So basically today... I'm going to talk about seven steps that you can use to share with your agents to help them make this breakthrough. And, if, you know, even if you don't have luxury real estate in your market, you can, number one, you can uh, increase your average price point of your agents. But number two, and most importantly, you can teach your agents to treat everyone like a million dollars regardless of their price range. So I think it's important to begin our time today by just finding luxury. No matter what product you are buying, this a luxury product. It's an expensive product. It's rare. It's exclusive. Not everyone can have that product. You know, luxury connotes perfection, but most importantly, 
luxury has history. You know, if you um, sit on behind the wheel of a Porsche at the Porsche dealership, well, the history of Porsche on the racetrack suddenly becomes a part of you as you nestle into that lever, you wrap your fingers around that steering wheel, you become part of that history, the history becomes you, and you buy into that whole luxury experience. You know, you can make a fake story too, like Ralph Lauren, the whole Ralph Lauren story is totally contrived, but luxury connotes history and a story, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Most important though, luxury has integrity, complete integrity, and luxury is beyond compare. For example, when you go back to that Porsche dealer to look at a car, you'll never hear them saying how crummy Ferraris are. The luxury stands on its own. It's important for you to understand this definition because this is what buyers and sellers expect in this arena, and you have to meet this definition yourselves. So let's continue on here. Why do we want to do this? Well, here's a house we sold um, this month last year, actually, for $13 million. And we were just doing some numbers here this year. We haven't had anything this expensive this year. I think our my high sale this year is eight something. And um, we were just doing some numbers on our market. And this year, to equal this one sale, we had to do seven transactions. So that's seven brochures, seven contracts, seven websites, seven trips to the photographer, seven everything. So obviously, it's better to be in the high end. Here's the, the pool for this house. This guy spent a million dollars in this pool. Unbelievable. And that's the other part about luxury real estate. You get to see some really cool houses. And as David mentioned, as we began our time together today, you get to meet some really awesome people. I cannot think of any other profession where at such an early age, when I started, 21, that I would have met the accomplished professional people that I have met as I have in luxury real estate. So it's really fun. And um, let's take it from here. Yeah, why it's worth it? There's a lot more money in luxury real estate. No question about that. And more money, the fewer transactions. So if we want to break into the luxury market, there's a couple ways we, be, we can begin. One way to start is we can you know, try to get on a listing appointment, and we can um, give the seller unrealistic expectations as to what they're going to get for the property. We can overprice it. We can overpromise. We can tell them, yeah, we'll have this sold in 30 or 45 days. We're going to advertise on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And towards that end, you can over leverage and overspend on marketing, run up your credit cards, and just go crazy with all kinds of money. You can undercharge. Do you know right now there are, um, I have to be careful how we do this though, in some parts of the country there are people who are competing in this arena who are offering to charge less than 1% as a, as a marketing fee. So that's another way you can go in here is to undercut everybody else in terms of price. But this approach really lacks integrity. And quite frankly, I've seen companies or agents do all of these things, you know, overprice, overpromise, overleverage, and undercharge, all on the same listing. And let me tell you, it's, it's difficult to compete with. So I'm just going to summarize the seven steps that we're going to cover here today that work because I know they work because I use them, and they also have integrity. And these are steps that you can share with your agents to help them increase their average price point. You can also take some of the things we're talking about here today and turn them into recruiting mailers, recruiting postcards, or even recruiting dialogues because what better way is there to sell your value to a potential agent than to tell them that you can coach them to a higher price point through using the seven steps. So importantly first is to identify the market you're going to work in and map it. I'll tell you how to do that. You've heard about a SWOT analysis. Well, I'm going to tell you about a SWOT analysis. Very similar but some important differences. We'll talk about opening the gate. Wealthy people have gatekeepers. You need to get to them and pass them become their friends and have them recommend you to their luxury clients. You have to have a process for everything. You have to overcome the big O. The big O. This is what keeps most agents on the sidelines of the luxury real estate business. Their, their complete, almost debilitating fear of the big O and how to overcome that. We'll talk about getting your first listing and then finally we'll talk to you about how you can get it sold and then tell the world. Makes sense. Let's crash right into it here. We begin by identifying and map your market. Help your agents identify where they want to work in the luxury market. Now, luxury real estate typically is defined as the top 10% of your market. So it's not really a price. In my market, that 10% works out to be a million dollars and above. In other markets, it could be $500,000 and above. And I know markets where it's $5 million and above. There's no numerical definition of luxury, but it's commonly accepted that it's the top 10%. So 
coach your agents to identify and map the market they're going to work in. Here's a market that I do not work in, but it's about 26 miles to the south of me. It's an island, and we started mapping this market. Every pin on this map represents a transaction that was $5 million or above. In addition to using a map like this, sometimes we'll use an assessor's map. Here's a, a picture of an agent who had these assessor's maps pasted to the wall. But what you want to do is learn everything you can learn about this market. You want to, your agents have to learn a two-year history. You know, who's bought here? Who sold here? Who are the prevalent builders? Who are the prevalent architects? What people of note live here? And then, most importantly, you need to build some important benchmarks about this market that you're deciding to concentrate in. For example, um, what is the average selling price per square foot? What is the average selling price per compared to assessment? Now, that benchmark will not work in Florida or California, but it works most other places. But, you know, find some benchmarks that you can use to compare the properties you're about to list with the market. You know, average days on market, average list to sales price ratio. Know every stat there is about this market, where a buyer is coming from. I know that in my market, if you get to be a million dollars and above, I know that number one, you're going to be a second home buyer. And number two, there's an 85% chance that you're going to be in the financial services industry. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but I know where the buyers are, what, what makes up the buyers here. And I'm not afraid to call agents, even if there's, a, if there's a sale that occurs in my market that I was not involved in, I'll ask, I'll call the agent and ask them about the buyer. I don't want their names, I don't want anything personal about them, I don't want anything too detailed, but I want to know what do they do, what kind of work were they in, what, what industry do they come from, because that's an important part of understanding the market. People value expertise in the high end, and you really need to be an expert, seen as an expert in the market that you've decided to concentrate in. The way you do that is through market mapping. You know everything that happened there for the past two years. And on step three, I'll tell you how you can monetize this market mapping. But let's instead move on to step two, which is what I call sweating the leaders. As you can imagine, people in the high end don't want to work with a commodity agent. You know, most agents have a five-point marketing plan, which says, you know, put a sign in the yard, put the house in MLS, put an ad in the paper, pat the seller on the back, and pray that it will sell. And that's a commodity agent. You cannot be seen as a commodity in the high end if you want to succeed in luxury real estate. You've got to sweat the leaders to come up with some USPs that will be different and unique and valuable for you. So what I tell agents to do is look at the agents who are in their market who are, that you're about to compete with and make a list. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And then E stands for everything they do. What do they do? that sets them apart from their competitors in the luxury market in where you want to concentrate. And then T stands for turning them around. When you turn them around, that's how we create our own USPs. So again, some of the S's I've heard when I talk to Asians from across the country is, oh, that market leader, that person's got the luxury market really tied up. I'll never be able to break in. They have an incredibly strong brand. They have a huge track record. They own the market. They have huge market share, and they have lots of experience in the luxury market. And even worse than that, they live the part. They live the part. They live in the area. They belong to the clubs. They drive the fancy car. How will they ever break in to that luxury market? So make a list of the S's, the strengths of the luxury competitors your agents will be facing in your particular market. And then we want to talk about the weaknesses. And what's amazing to me as I talk to agents from across the country is how similar the weaknesses are among the top competitors and markets across the country. For example, a lot of really established luxury agents never show their own property. <clears throat> they, um, they do very poor market preparation. They don't get the properties ready for market. They don't do anything to um, help their sellers prepare their property for sale. They often offer low co-fees. They don't split 50-50. They, or they offer really skinny co-fees, if at all. They make it difficult to cooperate. They're oftentimes aloof and arrogant. They hate to cooperate. They'll do anything not to co-broke. And in fact, you can sum the whole thing up by saying that they actually are acting like they're entitled to the listing. And many times they're actually indignant that a seller would even consider talking to another agent beside themselves. So this is all good stuff. I challenge you to look at the leaders in your marketplace and make a list of their W's with your agents, maybe during a sales meeting, and you'll find that your list will come up very similar to this one. So let's talk about what those luxury agents do in your market. Let's talk about the E's. Again, they delegate showings. They might use a lot of e-marketing. 
they're very detached from their team. They just show up during the listening presentation, then you never even see them again. Sometimes you don't even see them at the closing. They just never, they never show up again. Um, not cooperative. Um, maybe they do floor plans, maybe they don't. Or they hire a stager. These are some examples that I've gotten from agents across the country when they talk about what their competitors do. So now, if I want to be unique and different, if I want to set myself apart, if I want to bring more value to a luxury seller in my market, I'm going to create some USPs, unique selling propositions, that are the opposite of these. So that's where we get the T, which is to turn it around. So rather than feeling entitled to get your listing, I feel privileged to get your listing. Rather than doing a lot of e-marketing, I'm going to do a lot of direct mail. Rather than delegating showings, I'm going to be present for every single showing of the property. In fact, I'm going to give it my complete, undivided, personal attention. I'm going to offer a really strong Kofi. In fact, I'm going to give co-op agents the Ritz-Carlton treatment. You know, just as an, as an aside here, you know, if you think about your own budgets in your company and how much money you spend on marketing, it's probably the biggest part of your budget. And what are you spending that money on? You're spending that money to get 35% of the buyers to buy your listings direct. Aren't 65 to 70% of your deals co broked Right, of course they are. So whatever that percentage is in your market, know what it is. Because the cornerstone of your listing presentation needs to be how you treat other agents. What's your theory on cooperation? Because that's a, the cornerstone of my listing presentation, is to let them know that while I'm doing all this work to try to get that 35% of the market to walk through my door and more if I can, I understand that a lot of people are going to come from outside of the area or they have an, um, an attachment to another agent. So giving those other agents a risk Carlton treatment is really an incredible USP for me. And my last USP that I talk about a lot is my aversion to the word staging. Because everyone talks about, oh, I hire a stager, we have a staging company, we stage this, we stage that. I tell sellers, you know what? If an agent is really talking a lot about the word staging, they may not be in tune with a typical buyer buying multi-million dollar properties in this market because they don't want to be played. They don't want to be manipulated. They want what's real. Market preparation is an important distinction that I use in my marketplace. Now, I'm not trying to be derogatory towards people who stage or say you shouldn't stage. Market preparation is incredible. All I'm trying to illustrate here is how I turn it around and create a USP for myself when I'm trying to compete with a luxury agent who, for example, has a professional stager. You want know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I have X years in the business. Or if I'm new, I could say my office has X years in the business. We've had 10 years, 20 years, whatever the case may be, of watching what makes the eyes of the buyer light up when they walk through a multi-million dollar house. Based on that, we can help you prepare your home to make sure that when a buyer walks in the front door that, yeah, your eyes light up too. And that's not about being contrived. That's not about playing the buyer. That's not about manipulating the buyer. So create your USPs because you cannot be a commodity agent. There is no room for me to real estate in the luxury arena. Step three I call opening the gate because here's where you identify and market to key gatekeepers. People in the high, end, high net worth individuals have gatekeepers. They are um, service providers. Um, they belong to different groups and organizations. And they have individuals like you know attorneys and trust officers at banks. These are their gatekeepers. Here's some examples right here. You know, attorneys, CPAs, trust officers, investment advisors. See, all that information you got when your agent mapped the market, when you coached your agents to map their market, now you have something of value that you can bring to a gatekeeper. Because I can tell you from experience that there are two kinds of taxes that wealthy people loathe and attest. Property taxes and inheritance taxes. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I can tell you that wealthy people typically put their properties into a trust. There's all kinds of trusts out there, and this is not a class on estate planning or estate management or trust work, but the common denominator of all trusts where, in, where wealthy people own their real estate is that they all require a yearly CMA. Notice how I said CMA, because a lot of people assume they need an appraisal. Not true. They do not need an appraisal. They need a number they can use. And they file their trust return every year, every spring. They need oftentimes two numbers. They need the fair market value of the property, and oftentimes they need the fair rental value of the property, because a lot of times people put their property into a trust, 
and the kids are the beneficiaries, and then a certain amount of the trust gets transferred to the kids every year with, with, an, with a goal towards eliminating estate taxes, but the parents have to pay rent on the property, and they want the rent to be fair market value rent because these kinds of trusts get out of it. So they want to make sure the rent covers the expenses, but also passes the sniff test with the IRS. And as long as they have a CMA letter from an experienced agent who's backed up by a great company like yours, then that will pass the sniff test. And if you can market this service to attorneys, CPAs, trust officers at banks, and um, investment advisors, you will get your foot in the door. You will make the gatekeepers look good. You will help the gatekeepers bring value to their clients, make them look good, and you're the ones that they will recommend. Again, this is a long-term approach to the business, but you know, I took David to Bunny Mellon's house when we had it for sale a couple of years ago, and this is 100% how I got this listing. I did her estate tax you know, CMA work for years for her, saved her all kinds of money and property taxes, and, um, and even did her estate appraisals, which I'm not an appraiser, but my CMAs are detailed enough where they fly. There's no law that says you have to have an appraisal. You know, there's no bank involved here. This is just you know, filing an estate tax return. So it does work. So when you market to these gatekeepers, you can market this expertise you have to, um, to the gatekeepers. They want it, they need it. Aside from that, don't overlook service providers to the high end. These are also like gatekeepers. Let me tell you something. It's really hard to get the, the direct dial of a Fortune 500 CEO. It's really hard to get the cell number of a Fortune 500 CEO. But let me tell you who has it. Number one, the guy who fixes radar at the boatyard has it. Number two, the person who puts new grips on golf clubs at the club he belongs to has it. The person who puts new strings on the rackets at his tennis club has it. You know, the horse people have it. Um, his luxury auto dealer has it. Um, the people at the private airport have it. And even I put down Batman here. I won't tell you this whole story, but, you know, uh, my wife got this whole big thing about, um, you know, bats. It was a bad story about bats and rabies and all that stuff. And so you know, she called this bat guy to come to our house and bat-proof our house. You know, this guy can afford an expensive house. It's like six to seven or eight grand to bat-proof your house. Well, anyway, he's over there talking to me, and he mentions this other house he was just at owned by a local billionaire. He's really built a great relationship with this billionaire through the process of bat-proofing his house. And I'm only telling you this because you cannot overlook the other service, service providers who cater to people in the high end in your marketplace. Market to them. Become friends with them. Bring value to them. Don't look down your nose at them. I've not gotten huge referrals from people covered in boat paint, bottom paint, or that gross paint they put on the bottom of boats to prevent barnacles from growing. But those guys have the direct dials of Fortune 500 CEOs. Identify who they are, make a plan to bring value to them, you know, invite them to events, events at your office, and don't overlook them. They are a great source of business for your agents. Uh, charity events. I'll just spend a minute on this <clears throat> because, you know, depending upon the time of year in your market, like in Florida, it's in the wintertime. California might be the wintertime, and my market is in the summertime. But wealthy people love to go to charity events. They go to them all the time. You know, some of these things are $10,000 a ticket to sit at a table like this. Sometimes they're only $1,000 a ticket, and then people have to buy stuff at the silent auction. And what happens is, in your market, as a company owner or manager, you're being hit up all the time to buy ads in these programs, programs that nobody reads. But if you can take that expertise that you have and, and market that at the charity event. For example, what I'll do is, you know, I gave David a ride around my market by boat, and I talked to him about the local market. Well, I can give a, I can make a certificate for that same sort of a boat ride, put a value of seven hundred fifty dollars on it, make it into a really nice certificate, and donate it to a charity event, and it does two things. Number one, an auctioneer gives up there and does my commercial for me. You know how auctioneers are. But basically, they're conveying my expertise or my agent's expertise to this whole crowd of wealthy people who are in attendance. And then when they actually come to the event, let me tell you who buys the certificate nine times out of ten. It's a trust officer at a bank. Almost always. I mean, who do they bring? Clients. So you've done two things. You've, you've made a commercial in front of this whole event that people will actually see, unlike the ad that you have to pay for in the program. And number two is, 
when they actually use the certificate, and a lot of times they don't, but they bring their clients. It's a total win, win, win. It's really a great way to go. It reinforces the value, and it reinforces your perception as an expert in your marketplace. Okay, we're going fast here. And that individuals, yeah, get known through mail, information, um, everything's going to be regular and um, consistent. You know, people say to me all the time, and I'll cover this in a second of the marketing, but um, I'll just give you a, a preview right now to step number seven, which is that luxury buyers are hiding in plain sight. They're already in your market, and the keys to those buyers are already in your market. They're very easy to find. I'll tell you how to do that in just a few short minutes. And I just clicked past too fast here the word expireds. Um, expireds are the quickest way to get luxury listings. When I talk about marketing to gatekeepers, that can be a little bit longer process. But expireds in David's information, David's videos, David's teaching on expireds, guess what? It works in any price range. I use it in my price range. I use David's steps to expireds. His whole expired dialogue, I use It's perfect for the high end. People. Oftentimes in high end, we'll list with other people for whom it's an avocation, not a vocation. A lot of people who are second and third generation wealthy families where the money's really started to um, thin out, so to speak, or wear out or run out, I guess is a better word. Believe it or not, they'll get into real estate as a face saving move. And oftentimes, because of their connections, they'll get listings and they have no idea what to do with them. In fact, they have no idea about the whole concept of work. And so you will find a lot of expires in the high end. So Helping your agents create a really strong expired program, a really strong expired package, learning the expired dialogues that David teaches in his videos and in his systems will help your agents get listings more quickly, even in the high end. Now we're going to step four. Um, process is really important in the high end. Everything's about process. Think about the last time you checked into a luxury hotel. I don't know, let's say the Ritz Carlton. You walk into the front desk. And you say, hi, I'm here to check in. What happens? Does that person look up to you and say, oh, you want to check in? Let me think. Yeah, let me think. Oh, yeah, you probably got to want a room. I'll have to get a key. I probably should give you a map so you can find your room. They don't do any of that. They have a complete process for everything because part of what luxury is all about is you know, a great experience, a consistent experience, a predictable experience, a high-end experience. And the way you do that without messing up is to have a process for everything. So um, let's talk about that. Develop for your company and for your agents a pre-listing process. You know, things go bad in life in general and in real estate specifically when you don't meet people's expectations. Well, the best way to meet expectations is to teach people what they should be. So the best way to teach a potential seller is what their expectation should be is to have a pre-listing presentation. Simple. And part of my pre-listing presentation is to explain to them exactly what's going to happen. You know, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna prepare for the appointment? What's gonna happen during the appointment? What's gonna happen between the first appointment and the second appointment? What's gonna happen at the second appointment? So everything's there. It's not just all about me and a big commercial for me as an agent. It's really about the process that I will use to list their property. I use a two-step listing process. I'll cover that more under step seven. Understand also that there's a certain amount of performance art involved here. You have to show up looking the part. You have to show up. You're dressed right, looking professional. It is. You're you're on. You're totally on. I mean, think about the last time you went to a jewelry store. You went to a Tiffany's, or you went to a um, what's that place with sells the leather bags? Um, uh, I can't think of it. But anyway, uh, Gucci or whatever. When you talk to those salespeople, his performance style. When you walk into Tiffany's, what do they do? They they move slightly so they're right under that special light that makes the diamonds look great. They pull out a piece of black velvet and they lay it down on the countertop and they carefully, they have practiced how they move that piece of jewelry onto the black velvet so it can look its best. It's performance art coupled with sales and you have to do the same thing. Have and use a process for everything. I'm going to run real quick through my pricing process. You know What you hear all the time in the high end is that, well, those houses aren't like mine. But there's no comps to my house. My comp is, there's nothing like my house. There's no location like mine. There's no build like mine. There's no view like mine. There's no beach like mine. And you know what, Mr. Mrs. L, you're absolutely right. But here's the process I will use to interpret the market and apply it to your property. So first of all, we'll gather sales data. We will gather what data there is out there so we know what occurred in the marketplace. 
and then we'll adjust the sales to make them more like yours. I know that's not as good location as your location, so I'll adjust it to make it more like yours. I know that view is not as good as yours, so I'll adjust it to make it look more like yours. I know that the house is not as well built as yours or it's bigger than yours, so we adjust the sales. That whole thing about the, no house is like mine, we take it away from them when we adjust the sales. And, and in my book, or if you just email me, I'll send you, we've really simplified this process with a spreadsheet that makes it so easy to do. Then remember that benchmark we talked about under mapping your market? You know, things in this market are selling for, you know, $3,000 per square foot or $1,500 per square foot, whatever the case may be, but a benchmark is important. There's nothing wrong with, you know, pricing a home at 50% above the benchmark if you have a reason and you know you're doing that. Because guess what? Nobody in the high end who's a buyer is stupid. I mean, they're just not following up the turnip trucks anymore. They research the market. All the information is available to them. So if you're not, if you're above a benchmark, okay, know what it is and know why. But that's an important way to talk to a seller and blame things on Mr. Market rather than you being the grim reaper. Present it in secret. I never tell anyone about the price I've given to my seller, but then I bring the pricing committee through, and I can hear you now. I can see you looking puzzled on the other end of the webinar here, like, what's a pricing committee? Another way to say that is the office tour. So you bring the office tour through, they look at the property, and they all give their, their gut reactions to it, and then the seller selects the price, and then you test the price. You can test market acceptance today like you never could before through the internet. I tell people that for every thousand people looking at your house online, you should have one person through the door. So if you see, you know, you know, 5,000 views last month of all the various websites that you're marketing on, and um, nobody came through the door, that's the market rejecting your price. Time for an adjustment. So again, my presentation process, I like to tell the agents, here's what everybody does, here's what my company does, and here's what I do, my USTs. Remember those turnarounds we talked about? So we talk about the USTs. And um, the five things I like to cover is, um, whoops, too fast here, um, how, we, how we prepare your home for sale, how we present it to the market, how we do our marketing, how we cooperate with other agents, and how we negotiate. Step five is the big O. This is what keeps the agents on the sidelines. This is what really freaks agents out, it stresses them uh, before, during, and after listing presentations. They just go crazy over this. And this, the big O is this. They sit down with a seller, and the seller says, well, how many homes have you sold in my price range? How many homes have you sold in my market? And the agent knows this is their first one. They've never done it before. How do we overcome this? Well, the best way to overcome the big O is to coach your agents is to hit it right on. Hit it right over the head. You know, Mr. Mr. Seller, I have never sold a home in your area. I've never sold a home in your price point. I'm going to make my mark on your listing. Coach your agents to say and give them permission to say that, listen, your home is going to be the last thing I think about every night before I go to sleep and the first thing I think about every morning. In fact, I'm not going to take another listing in your price range in your market until we have an accepted offer on your property. Would you allow your agents to do that? That will help them overcome the big O. Mr. Mr. Seller, I'm going to make my mark on your listing. I want you to be so thrilled with my service to you that you can't wait to refer me to other friends, relatives, and associates that you have. So towards that end, it has to be you. It has to be your agent doing all this stuff. You are the reason why I can only take one listing until your property is sold. I'm the one who's going to measure. I'm the one who's going to list. I'm the one who's going to present to buyers and show it. I'm the one who do the copywriting and help you prepare it for the market. I am the reason that this is going to be limited edition. So step six, your first listing. Um, again, expireds are common. We talked about that. A lot of unqualified agents in the high end because they think it's glamorous. We believe that. And a lot of overpricing takes place because they don't have a pricing process. So um, I tell agents to find the maverick in your market. You know, when we talk about the $26 billion house that David um, talked about, I went to one of her other homes and it had a garage that probably cost, it must have cost, I don't know, 5 or $6 million to build the garage. It was the most beautiful garage you've ever seen. And there, parked in the middle of the garage, bathed in white halogen lights, was a metallic green Subaru Outback. She was a maverick. She was the one willing to take a chance on a new person. She's the maverick of your market. You've got to find the maverick in your market so that your agent will find the person who doesn't listen to um, all the advisors and will try 
a new agent. That's why I got my first luxury listing. I found the Maverick in my market. They want somebody who's new, fresh, creative, even a little bit audacious. So we diagnosed during our listing presentations. You know, people always forget this, and again, no one teaches better process for a listing presentation than David Knox. It works at all price points, even in luxury real estate. Follow your checklist um, and never, never, never give a price on the first appointment. <clears throat> A number, appointment number two, help your agents develop a really great listing presentation. You should have a company one, but one they can personalize to themselves. And um, oftentimes, you know, I have to go to New York City to give a listing presentation. It's not always at the property, but always come back to their motivation. Um, agreements in this market can be six to 12 months or more. It's a limited market, it's a seasonal market. You will have a lot of expenses up front. Um, you present their, um, their staging report. Um, give them written feedback, and then allow your agents to guarantee their work. This is a great way to get their first luxury listing when they can go to a seller and say, listen, if at any time you don't think I'm doing what I said I would do, if you don't think I'm as good as I said I was, or not doing what I said I would do, you can cancel the contract, no cost, no obligation to you. If you give agents to permission to make that guarantee, I guarantee they won't ever have to use it. Last step is um, get it sold and tell the world brochures. People still like brochures, even in this high-tech age. If you're new to luxury real estate, you're breaking into a new market yourself as a company, um, brand them for yourself, but also make some brochures that have no company branding on them whatsoever, which you can leave in other offices to help them get your property sold. Hardcover brochures, you can make them at shutterfly.com. What a great way to set your property apart. What a great thing to bring in a listing presentation to show potential sellers. Photography, iPhones are great. They have no place in luxury real estate. Here's an expired listing I took. Here's the agent picture. Here's my picture. You've got to have better photography than anybody else. Support your agents with that before picture, after picture. Direct mail really works in the high end. I can tell you that buyers are hiding in plain sight. Wealthy people like to be around other people like themselves, the same goals, the same aspirations, the same level of achievement. So if you want to market a luxury listing in your marketplace, the best thing to do is to market to the people who are already there because they have friends, relatives, and associates who are already here and are likely prospects for that um, property. You know, print advertising, I hate it, but you have to use it. The web, make property websites, it's an incredible marketing tool. The wealthy people were the first people to come online. Very important for you to be online. Also, I love property websites. Video, a bar is really being raised on video these days. Um, the most important thing with video is that you've got to tell a story. You know, a bunch of still pictures stitched together no longer works. You've got to tell a story with your video to draw people in and make them compelled to want to see the property inside. The danger with video is giving people so much information that they feel they don't need to see it in person. Open houses, absolutely, but they're not the kind of open houses you just do impromptu. You do it around an event. Here's an open house we did where <clears throat> we had antique golf stuff on display, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of antique clubs and golf balls that drew people in. And um, you can do that with a jewelry company, you can do it with a car company. Do some joint venture open houses in your marketplace. So just to summarize all this, will it work? It'll absolutely work. Remember the definition of luxury? Live the definition of luxury. Be the definition of luxury. Make sure your agent is the definition of luxury, as is your marketing plan. You know, tailor your approach to each person and follow the seven steps and it will work for you. The only difference is upstairs in your head. The only impediment is you. Create your process, create the mindset, and follow it and get it done. Okay, I'm done. Two quick things. If you want to create a business plan for your agents, they can go to luxurybusinessplan.com and just download a business plan in um, an Excel version. It's a great uh, way to get started with luxury real estate. If you're interested in knowing more about my book, you can go to jackcotton.com or you can go to amazon.com and get yourself a copy of Selling Luxury Homes. So, David, I'm not sure if I went too far over, but I can do some questions or whatever you want to do next. Wow, that is amazing. Jack, for all of you listening, I hope there's two things that I see just right off the bat. Not only is Jack incredibly professional what he does, you are really professional the way you present it absolutely organized and yeah you blew through that but I don't think anybody expects to become a luxury agent in 45 minutes um, but I would
Victor, I'm going to switch the organizer back to me because I want to uh, just show something. Um, I would encourage you all to go to jackcotton.com. And, and Jack, you have an opportunity for people to join something where agents can participate with you and just learn more about luxury real estate directly from you. Is that correct? Yeah, if you go to my website, you can get my free newsletter. It's a video newsletter that comes out every Tuesday afternoon. Just register at jackcotton.com, your first name and your email. And then the first Tuesday of every month is luxuryrealestateunplugged.com. You can look into that. Your agents can come in. It's live. It's, it's never planned. It's all unscripted. But people come with their challenges, their questions, their situations. And you get to learn from other people's questions, and other people get to learn from your questions. It's one hour, first Tuesday of the month. Okay. Do you, uh, luxury real estate unplugged dot com. Okay. And also, you do live seminars as well, still. Is that right, Jack? I do, yep. All right. So, any of our members, if you're looking for a speaker, uh, can certainly bring Jack in. In fact, you and I did a seminar together, which was kind of fun.